Discovery, go and throttle up. Discovery, Roger, go for deploy. Thank you. Thank everybody in the shuttle program. The crew is go for launch. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Johnson Space Center for the Demo-2 post-Splashdown Crew News Conference. Just two days ago, Demo-2 Spacecraft Commander Doug Hurley and Joint Operations Commander Bob Bankin splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico after 64 days in space, completing the first crewed flight of the SpaceX Crew Dragon. Their mission was to test the capabilities of the new commercial space vehicle for regular crew transportation to the International Space Station. But they contributed a whole lot more than that on their mission. During their 62 days aboard station, they dedicated more than 100 hours to scientific investigation and worked with the Expedition 63 crew on four spacewalks to upgrade the station's power system, among a num number of other items. Today's crew news conference is the first opportunity after splashdown to ask questions to Bob and Doug. We'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as on our social media platforms. If you're on the phone, please press star 1 to add your name to our queue and ask a question. And if you're on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA. Before we get to opening comments from the crew, we'd like to share some of the messages from around the world welcoming Bob and Doug back to planet Earth. Splashdown. Welcome back to planet Earth, and thanks for flying SpaceX. Thanks to all who submitted these messages using the hashtag Launch America. We'll now pass it to the Demo2 crew for some opening comments, starting with Doug Hurley. Well, it's great to talk to you today. Um, we're just a couple days removed from splashdown off the coast of uh, Florida near Pensacola. Excited to be back. We're already working through our uh, exercise and rehabilitation program to kind of get our earth legs back. Um, we were lucky that we uh, we worked out pretty hard on Space Station, and I think we've both uh, done pretty well up to this point. Um, we're also lucky in the fact that we landed in some pretty smooth waters, thanks to the weather folks. And so I think that helped a lot. Uh, just incredibly uh, excited to be back, incredibly excited to share the uh, mission with all of you in another way. And uh, just so proud of the uh, SpaceX and NASA teams to uh, get Dragon through its first crewed flight uh, flawlessly. Uh, just uh, we're almost kind of uh, speechless as uh, as far as how well the vehicle did and how how well the mission went uh, and all the things we did on board ISS with uh, Chris Cassidy and Anatoly and Yvonne. Uh, so just glad to be back and. Uh, it's great to see how excited uh, everybody was uh, for our, our mission and followed along, and, and we hope it brings a little bit of brightness to a pretty tough 2020. Thank you, Doug. We'll now hand it over to Bob Benkin. I think uh, Doug pretty much covered most of the things that uh, either one of us would say about the, the mission itself. Um, I would just add that you know, it's a, it's a humbling experience to be a part of uh, what was accomplished with the SpaceX vehicle. Just a, a wonderful team on the NASA side and the SpaceX side uh, to pull it all off. Uh, it took years in the making. I think Doug and I have been uh, working at it for a good solid five years to, to get to this point, and it's just uh, awesome to kind of see it to fruition. I know that uh, one of the things that we're most proud of is, is bringing launch capability back to the Florida coast, back to America and of course uh, landing safely at the end of all of that. And so uh, just uh, again, humbled to be a part of uh, such an awesome team and, and uh, awed by what they accomplished. 
Thanks to you both for those initial remarks. We'll now open it up for questions. Again, if you're on our phone bridge, please press star one to submit a question. To ensure we get to everyone's questions, please refrain from asking more than one at a time. We'll have a lot of questions, so if you find that yours has already been answered, press star two to withdraw it. And if you're on social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA. Let's start on our phone bridge first with Lauren Grush from The Verge. Hi, Bob and Doug. Good to talk to you, and congratulations on such a great launch. Um, leading up to this mission, the date of the launch was always so uncertain, and you mentioned you would plan your life in increments of weeks or months at a time. So I'm wondering how does it feel now after all that buildup, now that it's over and you have a little more certainty in your schedule again? Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know if certainty is the right word at this point. You know, it, it, I think for both of us, it still feels uh, pretty surreal. And I know that's a little bit overused, but I don't know how else to describe it. You know, one minute you're bobbing in the Gulf of Mexico and, you know, less than two days later, you're in a news conference. So, um, you know, it, it's been a time to reflect and, and, and think about a lot, of, a lot of the things that went on in the lead up to the mission, the mission itself, like, you know, the launch, the on-orbit time, the entry, the landing. Uh, but, yeah, at least we know we're done with the mission, which, you know, we didn't even really know launch dates until just a few months before we launched. We didn't know the duration of the mission until a few weeks before we came home. And uh, so I guess it's nice uh, in that in that respect, to, to be back with our family and our friends here at NASA and, and working through uh, the post-flight activities that we have. And they're pretty pretty well scheduled for the next few weeks, for sure. In fact, there's a lot of stuff uh, to do over the next few weeks. So we're hoping at some point just to take some time off and, and, and share a little more time with our families since the, they were the ones that really had to sacrifice over the, as Bob said, over the last five years. Um, because we were we were mostly in California, and we were mostly, obviously, the last two months in space. Next, we'll go to Andrea Leinfelder from the Houston Chronicle. Hey, welcome home. Bob, you gave a really great description of what it was like to launch in the Crew Dragon. I was hoping you could give us a similarly vivid account of what it was like to land. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrea. You know, the, uh, the landing was... I would say it was more than what uh, Doug and I expected. Um, things are, are always uh, pretty smooth as you work through a deorbit burn, because of course you're, you're still in low Earth orbit uh, while you take that little bit of energy out that it takes to lower you into the atmosphere and uh, start the trip home. Um, as we kind of descended through the atmosphere, I personally was uh, surprised at, at just how quickly it all, the events all transpired. Um, it seemed like uh, just a, a couple minutes later after the burn was complete, we could look out the windows and see the clouds rushing by at uh, a much accelerated rate. You know, one of the things we didn't have a lot of time to do during our time docked to station with how busy we were was to really focus on the Earth for an extended period of time. And, and during free flight and Dragon, we were able to do that and probably had a pretty good feel for the, the rate that the Earth was moving below us. And we could definitely tell things were picking up quick after we started that burn. Um, once we descended a little bit into the atmosphere, you know, Dragon really, it came alive. It uh, started to, to fire thrusters and, and keep us pointed in the appropriate direction. Um, the atmosphere starts to make noise. You can, you can hear that uh, rumble um, outside the vehicle. And as the vehicle tries to control, you feel a little bit of that, that shimmy in your body. And, and our bodies were much better attuned to the environment. So we could feel those small rolls and pitches and yaws and all those little motions were, were things that we picked up on inside the vehicle. As we descended through the atmosphere, the, uh, the thrusters were firing almost continuously. And I think uh, this the sound that that makes. I, I did record some audio of it, but uh, it doesn't sound like a machine. It sounds like an animal coming through the atmosphere with all that, uh, all the, the puffs that are happening from the, uh, the thrusters and, and the atmospheric noise. It uh, just continues to uh, gain magnitude as you, as you descend down through the atmosphere. And I think we both really, really noticed that aspect of things. Um, all the separation events from the trunk separation through the parachute firings were very much like getting uh, hit in the back of the chair with a baseball bat, you know, just a crack. And then uh, you'd get a, some sort of a motion associated with that, usually pretty light for the trunk separation. But with the parachutes, it was a pretty significant jolt 
um, and a couple of jolts as you go through the disreefing of the parachutes as well. And so uh, all the way down, uh, we, we were talking about it. I think uh, I took a line from an old movie that Doug and I were both familiar with at one point, because uh, under the G load of about 4.2 Gs, I uh, said, want to get some coffee? You know, much like we had seen in a, an old movie that we had watched, because that was really the, the feeling that we had had, and that's the best way to describe it. If you've seen a, an old movie that happened to have some guys uh, uh, who'd been in a centrifuge, that's what we felt like. When the time came to splash down, I think we were watching the altimeter, which is a GPS altimeter, so it's not super accurate everywhere that you're located. And so we got to uh, a below zero for our altitude on that indicator, which was a, a little bit surprising. And then we, we felt the splash and we saw it splash up over the windows. It was just a, a, a great relief, I think, for both of us at that point. And uh, I can't say enough at, about how well the SpaceX team trained us. You know, they provided us some audio clips of uh, what it was like inside the Demo 1 vehicle so that we were familiar with all those sounds. And uh, uh, reassuring is not quite the right word um, because we think of it more in technical, technical terms as, you know, pilots and engineers riding along with that vehicle. But uh, when it performed as expected and we could check off those events, uh, we were really, really comfortable uh, coming through the atmosphere, even though, you know, uh, it felt like we were inside of an animal. Let's go to David Curley from the Discovery Channel. Oh, Bob, what a description. Welcome back to, to both of you. Uh, I have a lot of technical questions, but let's do the fun question and the big question. Bob, uh, did you leave something for Megan? You don't have to tell me what it is. Will SpaceX leave it there? And, Doug, you said you would talk about the historical meaning uh, afterwards. Here we are. Big picture, what does this mean? Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome home. You go first. Well, uh, inside the vehicle, you know, it's it's not uh, something we don't do uh, is leave things behind. Uh, we do our best to, you know, keep it in ship shape. We did leave a, a patch. Uh, inside the vehicle, there's a Demo 1 sticker that, that we added, and we did give the ship a name, uh, Endeavor, and I'm hopeful that uh, they'll be able to keep both of those things as they go forward and, and add their, their decal to the interior of Endeavor. I guess uh, for me, from the historical aspect, that uh, I think, yes, yeah, certainly the, the first U.S. crewed vehicle since the shuttle, so nine years ago, uh, certainly uh, personally it, it's, it's significant because I was the last shuttle pilot and then the first commander, Dragon, and so that, that's, it, it's neat to think about now, you know, I, uh, and I certainly maybe a year from now we'll, we'll think a lot more about it, uh, but I, I, I'm, I, I'm more, uh, I think what's more important to me is the, is the historical aspect for NASA and, and certainly for SpaceX. It just, for a company that's only been around for a decade or a little more than that, to, to build a spaceship that takes crew into uh, orbit and returns them safely is just that, that part of the historical aspect uh, for me is, is probably most significant. It just, it's, and to be part of that for me is, is also by far the most important and one of the most incredible highlights that I'll have from a professional career uh, to, just, to just share in that, uh, that journey, that odyssey, that uh, endeavor as we, as we named our ship um, was just a, one of the true honors of, of, of my, my entire life, but certainly my professional career. We'll now go to Marsha Dunn from Associated Press. Hi, um, I'm wondering, did, did, did either of you realize real time that you were surrounded by pleasure boats filled with gawkers uh, so soon after splashdown? And if so, were you concerned? And if, if you were unaware of them, were you surprised to find that out afterward? And Bob, a real quick question, when's the puppy arriving? <laughs> Well, I guess since uh, Bob's got a, a really important question to answer, I'll talk about the boaters. Um, you know, this is something that we, we discussed uh, as a NASA SpaceX group prior to Demo 1, actually. And, uh, you know, we certainly appreciate the folks wanting to participate in the event. But, uh, you know, there's some safety aspects that I think, you know, as the administrator said, we'll have to take a look at because it just can't can't happen like it did before. 
but certainly we 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 were not uh and it's mostly due to the kind of the way the windows looked after after splashdown so you know the the re-entry is is a fairly dynamic event and you can see from you know just an overall view of the capsule that uh re-entry is a, a pretty demanding environment you know with the different uh scorches on the vehicle and the windows were were not spared any of that uh the look out the windows you, you could basically tell that it was daylight but very little else so we didn't really see anything clearly out the windows until the uh the spacex recovery crews got uh near us with the fast boats and then we could see a head or two out the window but yeah i had absolutely no awareness of the the other flotilla that was out there until we were uh, back on board uh Go searcher and in the uh, medical facility. Yeah, I, I just would add a little bit to that, which is you know folks uh, need to realize we were delayed with actually opening the hatch for an extended period while the teams really made sure that everything was clear and the the vehicle was safe uh, for us to exit and for them to get as many people as required to you know perform that extraction for us. And so, just a a, a word to the wise for folks who have ideas of, of coming that close again in the future that you know we take extreme precautions to make sure it is safe and uh, uh, we do that for a reason. And hopefully they'll appreciate that you know that's required really with us bracecraft operations. As far as the puppy goes. We're on about a two-week time frame where we'll uh, we need to teach my son a little bit about the things that are required to, you know, have a dog in the house and uh, make sure he's comfortable with picking up his responsibilities associated with the dog. Then, you know, I've done a lot of that with the IP phone from the space station over the last uh, couple months, but uh, now he's got to put his. Uh, put his work in to get the dog bed in the right location and, and, and show me that he's ready to take on that responsibility. And you know, he's gonna, he's gonna love that, that puppy and he's gonna, you know, he needs to bring him up right. And so we're gonna set him up for success. Uh, otherwise, uh, it'll be my dog instead of his. <laughs> Let's go to Robert Perlman from Collect Space. Hi, Bob and Doug, great to see you back on Earth. Um, up until now, after a historic NASA first flight like yours, it would almost be a given that something from the mission, the spacecraft or the space suits, would be headed to the Smithsonian. But given the commercial nature of your flight, very little of your mission's equipment belongs to NASA, and your spacecraft is already slated to fly again. So were it up to you, what would you like to see SpaceX donate to the National Air and Space Museum or otherwise put on public display? And might we see your sons agree to donate Tremor? Well, they, uh, they they might make that agreement. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they would request something in trade. I don't know, at least an opportunity to go see where Tremor's uh, new home would actually be. I think there's a lot of Tremors out there as well at, at this point. And so uh, uh, I think that it could be that the marketplace is saturated with uh, Tremors. Uh, as far as what I'd like to see donated, you know, I still think there's an opportunity for the history to play out and this capsule to still end up in the Smithsonian. You know, it can be used and, and reused and then find that uh, permanent home. Uh, SpaceX has done a wonderful job. If, you, if you've ever visited or seen pictures inside the facility there in Hawthorne, uh, they do have uh, hardware that they've flown or hardware that they've tested and managed to put on public display. Um, right here, we do have a, uh, here in, in Houston at the Space Center Houston, they do have a, a first stage now that uh, was used and uh, it's, it's nice to have that in full public view. And, I, and I'm sure and, and confident that they are going to share pieces of the hardware with the public at large. You know, if you, if you go out to Hawthorne, there's a first stage uh, sitting right there on the corner of the, the, the property line there. And it's, uh, it's just awesome for people to see that hardware and be able to you know, recognize it as, as hardware that was used for, for space missions and uh, you know, take a picture next to it and, and be a part of it. And so I know they'll do it. And if it was up to me, I think all this, uh, this hardware has a home someplace uh, in the future when it's used up. It's just not used up yet. Thank you. We're now going to switch to social media for just a second. First of all, you have folks from all over the world on Twitter and Facebook saying hello and congratulations. Brazil, England, Canada, Argentina, the Netherlands, all over the U.S., just to name a few. But this seems to be a common theme. This one's from Shanika. Uh, who gets to keep Tremor? Well, I think I think we're probably going to go along the lines of, uh, I believe it's the NHL. 
um, where the team that wins the uh, Stanley Cup, if you're familiar with that, um, each member of the team gets to gets to have the Stanley Cup for a day or two, and I think we'll probably work out something along those lines where we just have a, you know, he spends some time at, at Bob's place, and then he spends some time at our place, and, you know, I think that's fair. And then I think at some point, obviously, the boys will, you know, they're going to grow up and potentially outgrow Tremor, and, you know, we'll figure out a good a good place for for tremor as well just like hopefully with the endeavor and our suits and anything else that was associated with this mission it's just it's just a neat memory for bob and i as fathers uh you know to share uh, this type of thing with our sons and and uh we're just thankful that we were allowed to to take tremor with us and uh and it's frankly just amazing to see the the response to Tremor and, and how, how much people enjoyed that part of the mission uh, along with some of the other things. So we really appreciate appreciate that and thank and thank folks for understanding, you know, that it was important to us. We'll take one more Ask NASA question. This one from Leanne on Facebook asking, what's the first thing you ate after returning to Earth? I think for both of us, the first thing we ate was the pizza that they had uh, available on the jet that uh, brought us back into Houston. So. We had a, a good pizza. We, you know, we've done a, a lot of travel on the uh, aircraft operation uh, folks here at uh, Johnson Space Center's uh, aircraft over the last uh, 20 years, frankly, whether it was T-38s or as we responded to COVID and, and used the larger airplanes to help us get from place to place from a training perspective. And, and they always have a good plan for taking care of the crews that are on board. And, and our landing day was no different than the other days. They had us all hooked up and set up and uh, the pizza was waiting when we made it on board. Thank you. We'll now return to the phone bridge, starting with Eric Berger from Ars Technica. Uh, hi, guys. I want to congratulate you on your, your excellent timing. Houston in August is lovely. Um, if I may ask a, a non-tremor question, uh, were there any surprises during the mission? It all looked so smooth from the launch to the landing, you know, to us watching on the ground. And it, was it really that perfect? Like, did the vehicle perform that well, or was there anything that happened? Like, maybe you went in a capsule on orbit and there was a funny odor or, you know, something that alarmed you during the two months you were up there, or, or, or was it all just that smooth? Thank you. Yeah, frankly, the, the DM-2 mission part of it, uh, as well as the uh, docked ISS mission that we participated in, Expedition 63, but certainly the DM-2 mission, um, I personally expected there to be more, you know, certainly not issues with the vehicle, but some challenges or some things that were maybe not quite what we expected. I mean, even on our shuttle flights, we had things that happened on both of mine. And I know, you know, Bob and I have talked a lot about his missions as well. There were things that happened that, that were right out of a simulator uh, uh, event and, and something that you certainly wouldn't have expected in a real flight. But, but I, my credit, once again, is to the, the folks at SpaceX, uh, the production folks, the people that put Endeavor together, and then uh, certainly our training folks. The mission went just like the simulators. And, and I, I'm honestly from start to finish all the way. It, there was really no surprises. And I think for me personally, I expected the entry to diverge somewhat by what we saw in the simulator. And what I mean by that is as, as a capsule gets in the thicker air of the atmosphere, so somewhere around 20K down to maybe 10K, just prior to the drogues with, the, with Dragon, I expected there to be some divergence in attitude control because it's, it's a real tough problem for uh, the ship as it gets into the thicker air to maintain perfect attitude and control. And at some point, and, and then the design of this vehicle is for the drogues to come out potentially a little bit earlier than they normally would come out uh, to kind of right the vehicle. I, I fully expected that to happen, and it did not. The vehicle was rock solid right up until the nominal drogue deploy uh, altitude. And, and as Bob described, you could feel it. You knew exactly, you felt the decel, you knew the drogues both worked. And then it was the same with the mains. We felt the different stages of this reef and uh, right to the impact in the water. It was, you know, we kind of had a feeling it would be not as much as a Soyuz landing as it was described to us, but uh, it was gonna be a pretty firm splashdown. 
and then you know how we bobbed even how we bobbed in the water and how the vehicle uh sat in the water uh, so my compliments to spacex and the commercial crew program uh, the vehicle performed exactly how it was supposed to and uh you feel really good about uh, crew one and 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 what they should expect and what they should see when they fly their mission Next is Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Oh, hey guys, welcome back. Uh, good to see you. Um, two quick ones. Uh, just looking for maybe Bob a description of what it was like inside Dragon when the heat was building, that plasma was building. Uh, were, were you cool? What the view was like? And then maybe uh, Doug, if you could talk about how many calls you made on the sat phone and who you called. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> You know, as, as we uh, came through the atmosphere, I think we had a pretty good view uh, out the window until the G started building, at least for me. My focus kind of shifted towards the display content and the, the windows are down by our feet. And so being able to look at those requires kind of head motion and, and, and pushing your body around. And so just didn't seem like the smartest thing to do, you know, as the vehicle was maneuvering and starting to put Gs on to be uh, turning our heads and, and trying to move around in the seats uh, at that point. We were trying to make sure that we were good and, and strapped in. I do feel like I, I felt some warming of the capsule um, on the inside. And so the real notice was that when I did get a chance, once the G's had come down to look out those windows again, you know, they were obscured as Doug described earlier. And so we kind of saw the clouds racing by and then the G load started to build up and we focused on you know, monitoring the vehicle and uh, uh, paying attention to those small bobbles that we could feel as it uh, controlled the attitude. And then uh, there was not much to see out the windows uh, by the time we had another chance to do it, so. Yeah, and I think I'll just add, I, I had an entry that was a night entry and then a day entry. And it's, it's tough with shuttle even to see the plasma in the daytime. It's almost just this really thin pinkish hue that you could, in the in the front seats of the shuttle you could pick up just very it was it was very difficult to see so i certainly didn't expect with a full daytime entry like we had with dragon and then as bob described the the position of the windows relative to where we sit until the seats adjust for the uh the uh basically to get our heads more vertical than our, our feet after we're under parachutes, uh, you really have to work pretty hard to just see out the windows. And as far as the uh, sat phone, um, yeah, that that probably was a pretty funny to hear that you have an astronauts calling whoever we can call. But uh, there there was a, a real reason for it. Um, you know, Nick Hag when he had his uh, abort on board Soyuz, they they also have a, a phone where they're able to call folks, but some of the numbers either weren't correct or weren't loaded. And as I think most people know in this day and age, we know very few phone numbers by heart like we used to know many years ago. And so we wanted to uh, get a test objective uh, out of the way, which was to call the, uh, the core uh, station at uh, Hawthorne and when we called to say, hey, we would like to do that, they said, stand by. And so we decided we would exercise our uh, judgment and use the phone to call some other folks. So we called Anthony, I think, at the, at the Capcom console or at the flight director console here. And, uh, you know, hi, this is Bob and Doug. We're in the ocean. And then uh, we also called our, our, uh, our wives who happened to be together. I think they were here at Mission Control. And of course, they were excited. And, and, and as all folks know, um, that have gone through this as a family member, you're kind of helpless uh, until you hear the voice of your of your loved one on the other end. And, and this was a great chance to reassure them that we were in the water, we were okay, we were feeling good. And then and then at that point, we were still waiting on SpaceX, and so we just decided to call a few other people that we knew their phone numbers to. And we got a hold of a few, but if anybody's ever used a SAP phone. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't connect. So it was a, but it was a very successful test and we're confident that future crews, if they need it, it it's a good, uh, a good option for communication. Next is Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Hi guys, congratulations on a uh, successful mission and welcome back to earth. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just wanted to, you know, this by all accounts was a very successful test flight. Um, just based on your experiences, can I get uh, one of you to comment on if you think Crew Dragon is ready to go for crew rotation missions to the ISS uh, with your successful return? Thanks. 
You know, I, I think both of us are in agreement, uh, no questions, that the Crew Dragon, once they finish the certification process, you know, they do need to uh, look at the data from our entry. You know, it's not just the, the end user's anecdotes of uh, how well it performed. Uh, they, they will do a, a very thorough review, both on the SpaceX side and the NASA side, to make sure that they're comfortable. But from a crew uh, perspective, uh, I think that it's uh, definitely ready to go. There are things that can be improved, just like even with the final flight of uh, the space shuttle. I know Doug will tell you that there are things that could have been improved or would have been improved if we flew uh, 136. And so there'll be some things that we'll have some ideas about how we could make better to make things a, a little bit more comfortable or uh, a little bit more efficient inside the vehicle for those crews. But uh, from a crew perspective, I think we're we're perfectly comfortable saying that uh, uh, Crew One is ready when they finish the uh, the engineering and uh, analysis associated with certification. One thing I, I would just like to add about that, you know, Bob and I talked many times over the last uh, couple of years about the duration of the flight, and for a long part of that, until just you know, the essentially the beginning of this year, you know, it was going to be the same length as the DM1 flight, so just uh, a few days in space, and I think. I personally feel a lot better, even though there were some challenges dealing with the, you know, the duration of the flight and when when all that would come together. I certainly feel much better from from the crew one perspective and and subsequent flights of having Dragon docked to station for two months is a much better uh, outcome for me than if we'd have just been up there a few days. If you're asking the crew one folks to be up there for a full up six month ish type duration i think they should have a lot more confidence that the vehicle does fine in the quiescent mode dock to station and there and there wasn't anything that maybe wouldn't have been uncovered had we just been up there for just a few days so i, I thought that was a much better outcome we have gina sinceri from abc news what mission would be on the books for you both next what would you like to do uh, at least for me, I think in the short term, is uh, I transitioned to a support role. As you know, my wife is assigned to a, a, a SpaceX mission, and we have a, a young son. And so I'll uh, definitely be focused on making sure that her mission's as successful as possible and supporting her just as she did for me over the last five years with the uncertainty in our launch dates and our uncertainty in our return dates. Uh, it's it's definitely her turn to, to focus on getting her mission accomplished while I take care of a uh, the things that need to be taken care of for our home life. Next is Elizabeth Howell from space.com. Welcome home. And uh, I wanted to know what kind of lessons learned or kind of advice that you would be giving to the crew one when they get ready to go. That's a great question. And, you know, we have a, a tag up with those guys, I believe early next week. And I think we've mentioned before that we, we talked to them shortly after launch. And once we were docked, just to kind of, while it was all fresh in our memories, uh, a, a data relay to all the things that we, we noticed or saw, sounds and the things that really can't be emulated very well in a simulator and, and things that would, that, that would trigger, you know, any of the other uh, training objectives that uh, they're going through right now as they wrap up their training. And so I think Lessons learned, you know, there, there are always lessons learned, um, you know, things that, that we did that maybe we could be more efficient about or that we learned or that we thought maybe would work one way or that uh, maybe w would work better for another. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's more just relaying the experience and, and, and what we did in those particular situations and, and, and also trying to at least imagine what it would have been like to have four people in the vehicle rather than two. We did some docked operation uh, evaluations with four people and, you know, we had Anatoly and Chris act as the other two crew members and, and their vast experience in, in flying Soyuz and spaceflight in general, they had some great uh, suggestions and we, we at the time passed those things on uh, in the debrief and, and we'll definitely talk to the crew one folks about that as well. But. Uh, yeah, there's a very formal process and then an informal process, and we'll just try to pass on everything that we learned and, and what we think might work the best with uh, a crew of four. We have Joey Roulette from Reuters. Yeah, thanks for doing this. And Bob, I really appreciated that um, description of descending in Crew Dragon you gave earlier in the call. And I was wondering, do you think there's anything SpaceX can or should do to make 
uh, Crew Dragon's descent calmer, or is that the way it should be, and is that what you expected? Thanks. I think from a, a crew perspective, you know, really what's important is that you understand the events that the vehicle is going to go through and, and know what to expect. And so uh, the thing that I found most valuable having gone through that uh, experience was uh, something that the, actually the launch team put together for us, uh, pulled together some ascent video from both demo one and the uh, abort test that they performed to show what the sounds in Dragon were synced up with uh, the video feed. And so being able to watch that and hear the sounds and see what they corresponded to uh, on the video from uh, you know the outside tracking cameras that were in place was just invaluable from my perspective and really understanding what the vehicle was going to be going through and be comfortable as, as we went through it and, and monitor it appropriately. And so, you know, both Doug and I had confidence uh, like we described earlier that you know the drugs had come out and that the, the reefing had uh, happened according to schedule just based on being able to watch that video and hear the sounds and uh, have it all synced up we just knew what to expect you know uh, this maybe sounds a little bit boring and i'm going to get probably some flack from talking about a movie cliches again but uh you know there's a there's a movie groundhog day where they're sequencing through and everything is predictable and and for dynamic events like a uh, a space flight for ascent and for entry it really is invaluable as you try to uh, control your body and and come through that environment whether it's a g loading or it's the dynamics of a pitch yaw and roll moving you around inside the vehicle, knowing what to expect really sets you up for success to uh, work your way through it and do anything that you might need to do in those dynamic situations. And I think that that video that the SpaceX team put together was just wonderful. And uh, I watched it again on orbit and before we came home. And I, and I know um, that'll be in our list of things that we recommend to the Crew One guys, um, if they haven't already watched it, that that's something that they should uh, kind of commit to memory and, and consider even having available on orbit. Next is Morgan McFall from Business Insider. Hi, Bob and Doug. Welcome home, and thanks so much for taking my question. I'm wondering what you would most like to see for the partnership between NASA and SpaceX going forward, and what are you most excited about in this new era of human spaceflight? Thank you. Well, it's it's neat to see SpaceX is uh, in the competition to build the lunar lander with two other companies. And uh, we, we've had, as an agency, we've had a wonderful partnership with SpaceX, you know, from commercial cargo to commercial crew, and they just continue to uh, work towards the goal of uh, getting humanity out into the cosmos. And, and it, it's, it's been a great relationship. It's been very beneficial for both SpaceX and for NASA. And, and this, once again, the success of DM2 uh, proves that it, it should be something that we should continue. And I, I'm excited uh, to see that happen. Uh, it was, it was, a, it was a, a lot of work to, to get from where we started five years ago to now, but uh, it's just they're a wonderful company to work with, and they have some incredibly talented people. Um, and, and I think there, there's plenty to come from, from the relationship that NASA and SpaceX have. You know, from my perspective, it, it really is critical that we continue to try to build on that relationship that Doug's referred to. You know, it, it won't be appropriate if we take the next step, which is to restart with a different NASA team and a different SpaceX team. We really need to leverage those relationships and continue with all the, you know, the five years of experience that we have of figuring out the things that NASA can best share with SpaceX to make them as successful as quickly as possible. And, you know, that applies to all the partnerships that uh, NASA sets up is figuring out the best way to communicate and share information is how we're going to all cooperate to get to our end objective. And so uh, I just uh, am really excited as we go forward that uh, the relationships and the, the work that's uh, the groundwork that's in place is going to be leveraged to accomplish even more great things in the future. We'll take one from Mark Corot from Aviation Week wondering what the uh, primary question you're getting from your astronaut colleagues is and what you're telling them about the experience. Actually, we, we haven't had a ton of interaction with uh, anybody given that, you know, when you get back from space, you have a pretty uh, compromised immune system to some degree. So we're taking every precaution that we can to, to try to stay away from uh, most folks, uh, although there is a, a, a lot of medical testing and, and rehabilitation that's going on, but there'll be time to do 
uh, debriefs. And I think, as I mentioned before, uh, certainly with the Crew One folks uh, coming up here pretty shortly. Uh, but yeah, we haven't seen a lot of them because you know we're just in in the stage of the pandemic where we're we're still I think even the folks that are haven't gone to space are are, are trying to distance and uh, wear masks and those kinds of things. But we we definitely know that there are a lot of questions. We've certainly gotten a lot of texts and emails, and uh, hopefully we can describe everything uh, from memory uh, that that is pertinent. And as Bob said, you know SpaceX will certainly have a a synced up video with audio for our ascent as well as our entry that that will be passed on for multiple crews for them to, to use. Yeah, I, I would say we're still in the phase where all of our astronaut colleagues aren't asking us for information. Um, they know now is not the time for that. They're they're asking us, do we need anything? Are our families well taken care of? Are, are we in good shape? And so that's their primary focus right now is you know taking care of the team, which is the astronaut office. And so I, I, all the well wishes that come in are, do you need anything? Is there, don't climb a ladder, I'll change the light at your house, so all those sorts of things. And it's just been wonderful how many folks have reached out to try to you know, make sure that we're well taken care of uh, after the, the mission that we, uh, we just went through. And, and it's like that for every mission when crews come back. We'll now go to social media for a few more questions there using hashtag AskNASA. This one comes from Natalie on Twitter. What is the reconditioning process like to get reacquainted with gravity? Well, we'll spend two hours every day with uh, our strength and conditioning uh, specialists. And, and, and it's essentially just a walk before you run, literally, uh, type process. We do some stretching, we do some uh, aerobic exercise, we do some lifting and some agility drills. And it's, it's uh, you're pretty tired after the two hour process. And uh, we've just, just started it yesterday. So on day two, uh, and it will continue for roughly 45 days. And most, most people really adjust in, in that time, certainly before you get to 45 days, but it's a continuous process to get you right back to where you were pre-flight. We'll take one more from social media. This one from Leo on Twitter. What is the greatest lesson that a young person can learn from this mission, especially in these challenging times? I, th I think the greatest lesson folks can take from our experience is one of perseverance. You know, uh, Doug and I didn't get to this opportunity, and this team didn't get to this success without years of hard effort, you know, challenges along the way. Uh, it doesn't build doing something complicated like developing a new spacecraft and launching it, developing a new rocket, and then putting a spacecraft on top of it and launching it to the International Space Station. Is just a, it's a tremendous level of effort that's required to accomplish that. And it's, uh, there are setbacks, you know, there are, there are challenges where, you know, rocket performance isn't what you expected or uh, a propulsion system on board a capsule isn't uh, exactly everything that you thought it was. And, and you have to adapt to those challenges and you have to overcome them and continue forward and maintain both optimism and paranoia as you go through that uh, perseverance. And so you, those are all normal things as you try to accomplish, you know, challenging tasks. And so I'm hopeful that uh, our experience, the entire SpaceX team's experience, and the NASA team's experience, one of uh, just a, the focused effort for an extended period of time, you know, re can lead to just awesome results if you if you you stay focused. And so, that message of perseverance is the one that I would want to share. We'll now go back to the phone bridge, starting with Marina Corin from the Atlantic. Hi, Bob and Doug. Welcome back. What advice would you give to future Crew Dragon passengers who are not astronauts? Uh, and a quick second question. You've been close friends for years. Did your friendship survive this historic experience? <laughs> All right. Um, what advice would we give the kind of the non-professional astronaut when they're flying on Crew Dragon? Purely that the SpaceX and NASA collaborated to build a tremendous vehicle that is very capable of the mission to go to and from low Earth orbit safely. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a comfortable vehicle. Uh, there are things that are just an aspect of flying in space that uh, I think most folks don't quite realize or understand. Uh, there are times when it's uncomfortable. There are times when, uh, you know, you, of course you can't take a shower. Uh, you know, going to the bathroom is a challenge, and uh, but but I think in general, 
uh, it, it's an outstanding vehicle and, and they should be uh, excited to fly on board to get that experience if, if they're lucky enough to do it. And I think as far as our friendship, it certainly survived. Uh, if anything, it just got stronger, you know, being part of a crew with Chris uh, and an Ant Anatoly and Yvonne, uh, it was just neat to see the team developed. You, you know, as Bob had mentioned before, and I, I'm sure I did too, we, we've known Chris for a long time. I flew uh, with Chris uh, on our first flight together, and uh, it, it just was really neat to see the, the, the Expedition 63 crew develop and, and work through the last few months, and um, it was very, very rewarding. And I think for me personally, I, I maybe I didn't appreciate uh, that aspect of it as much, uh, you know, going into the flight because I think, you know, our huge concern and challenge was was making sure DM2 flew the way it ended up flying successfully, and so uh, it, it was it was neat and, and it just was such a huge advantage I think for Bob and I that we are close friends, that just the crew coordination part of it and Flying Dragon was almost via telepathy sometimes. You know, we, we didn't even have to say anything, whether we were pointing at something or if we just, at that particular moment, looking at that part of a display because that's what we knew would be the thing that was most important. And I, I just think that, uh, you know, I know that doesn't necessarily always go into the selection process, but I think, you know, in this case, uh, when we were selected to fly this mission together, it certainly gave us a distinct advantage over some crews. Uh, and, and, and it was certainly very much appreciated by me. Yeah, just as Doug said, being able to add Chris to our friendship and uh, Anatoly and Yvonne is, is really how Expedition 63 worked out. You know, it was us focused on the mission and, and Chris as the commander of the space station, being able to shift into the support role when it came time for us to get docked and then us to shift into our support roles once we were on board the space station. Of course, the spacewalks activities have various uh, sync points where the kind of the leadership kind of moves around and, and we were able to do that very seamlessly. And, and part of that is, you know, related to just how close and how, how strong our friendships were kind of across the board. And so, and of course, when we came to the end of the mission and it was time to undock, uh, Chris jumped back into that support role again and, and helped us with the cargo transfer that we needed to put in place, some of the powered play, payload activities. We just, uh, it was all very seamless. Folks understood what their responsibilities were and we were able to you know, cooperate and work together to, to make it all happen and, and get the mission done. And so I would say, you know, our friendship is stronger and uh, we added some folks to our circle as well. Next is Mary Liz Bender from Cosmic Perspective. Welcome home, Bob and Doug. I want to first thank you for sharing that wisdom on perseverance. Um, you shared a lot of stunning images of Earth while you were on the station, and I really enjoyed the perspective you gave with the captions that you used. And I just wanted to ask, what compelled you to share so much, and what was your favorite location or feature to photograph? Well, I think, I think we can both answer that one. Um, you know, for me, I just, every time you look out the window of the space station, and, and certainly we didn't get the opportunity that I thought we were gonna get, you know, based on the description of, of previous crew members, that we, our, our time was uh, used up a lot to, to make up for the fact that, you know, we were down to three crew members on the space station uh, prior to us getting there. And, uh, I think, and, and rightly so, the, the International Space Station program needed needed us to get to work right off the bat. But the time that we did get to do that, you know, the perspective that you have from low Earth orbit of our planet is just one of just complete awe of, first of all, how beautiful the planet is and, and that there are no borders uh, that you can see from space, that the atmosphere is so thin. And then literally every time you look out the window, you see something different and even more beautiful than the last thing you saw the last time you looked out the window. And it's always different. And, and maybe more so this year than, than in past years that, that astronauts have taken photographs out the window. You know, the country, the country, the United States and the world has been dealing with so much uh, 
chaos and drama and the pandemic and all the things that have been going on in the world. And, and you know, if it were me, it would make me feel better to see these pictures from space. And so I think we just felt like it was a, a way to, to maybe have, have folks maybe have a distraction for a while and, and also to appreciate the, the planet that we've been given. You know, it, it's, 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 it's unique in that, in that standpoint and it's just beautiful to look at. And, and, it, and it's, I, I personally feel it's our obligation to share what we see because not everybody is gonna get to go to space and, and to, to just bring as much of the experience to, to everybody back on the earth is, is something I thought was very, very important. You know, I, I think for both of us, we didn't expect to have a longer duration mission. We expected to have just a few short days, which would have really limited our opportunity to share the, the station life aspects or the things that you can see from low Earth orbit or from the space station with folks. And when we got the opportunity for a longer mission, I think we both wanted to take advantage of that. You know, I, I think the Earth below us is a, is a, a wonderful view, just some amazing things to see. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a physics trained engineer background sort of a thing. And so I, I was really interested in the, the things that were examples of science or engineering or just physics below us or above us that was happening. And so whether it was light shimmering across the ocean surface or it was sunrises or sunset and trying to figure out how to get a photo and share that so that somebody else could have the same wonder that we have when we get a chance to see it ourselves was was what was really important to me we had some interesting you know um, conditions uh, during the flight we had a, a period of time where we were in continuous daylight uh, we got to do a spacewalk in continuous daylight which was just a uh, crazy to imagine, you know, being outside the entire time uh, with with the sun up the entire time was just a, a strange thing to kind of get your mind around. And, and we got to got to have uh, that experience. And so as a part of that, I think it, it took away the opportunities for us to get as many shots of the, the comet, uh, Neowise, that uh, was uh, uh, rising. It kind of came in that same period. So we had too much light to be able to see it very much. But uh, just all those things that you can see, whether it's lightning or the cities at night or or look out at the Milky Way and see the stars in the, in the background or just see the glow of the, the earth and see that it is not dark even at night uh, compared to the darkness of space is uh, just imagery that we wanted to share and maybe uh, in spark an interest of the wonder that we were able to see and whether it's a child or an adult that's out there so that uh, in this year um, and in years in the future, folks can look at that and, and be inspired to have the kind of careers that we've had or you know, chase a different dream than the one that we've chosen. Next is Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Thank you. Um, I realize you're still digesting all of this, but if you, if the decision were up to you about when to fly a friend, family, other non-professional astronauts, um, do you think that the system is mature enough after just perhaps another two flights to have that kind of mission? That's a good question. I think um, if, if it were me and it was a family member, it certainly, as Bob described, there's a certification process that the, that that endeavor hasn't completed yet, and it'll likely be weeks. And I think from my experience of flying fighters and and testing fighters, you know, a, a first flight, there's a lot of scrutiny on a first flight, and there's a lot of work that goes into a first flight. But you can't let your guard down, and you 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 got to take a look at the data. You got to listen to the hardware, and you, and and it's probably going to take a few flights, uh, because, you know, we certainly did our best, and I think the teams did their best to script this flight to be a a, a full up test flight. But there are certainly things on Dragon that can be tested more, and. There, uh, just for an example, you know, we dock to the forward part of the space station. There's certainly the likelihood that a Dragon is going to have to dock to a different docking port, either the uh, Zenith, I think it's the Zenith port that uh, is likely to be next for a commercial vehicle. And and it may sound somewhat insignificant, but it but it but it isn't. And so, uh, all the software that needs to go into the the vehicle uh, trajectory analysis and the things that they need to do in order to make that. Uh, 
that possible. And, and for our flight, that was not possible. There, the software hadn't been written yet to do those uh, to do that uh, docking port. So, just things like that. So I think it's going to take a few flights before, uh, and I think that's prudent. Uh, a few flights before you know, we can consider this vehicle completely tested. And then, as we all know. You know, the space business, like uh, a lot of those uh, technically challenging businesses, uh, is not forgiving. So you, you, the, the bigger thing to take a look at is to just not let your guard down and don't just assume because the last flight went perfectly that the next flight's going to go perfectly. You have to, you have to do that rigor and that analysis and, and that attention to detail, and you can't get complacent. And you can never get complacent with the, with the space vehicle. That's all the time we have for questions today. Thanks to all who submitted questions, and thanks to Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley for taking the time to discuss this historic event. The Demo 2 mission is part of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. We have more milestones, com milestones coming up in the very near future. So for the latest, please visit nasa.gov slash commercial crew. Thanks again for joining us. That'll wrap up today's Crew News Conference. <laughs>